December 21st, 1994. A young president whose credentials on military matters were in question under pressure to invade Cuba. Tonight, the JFK tapes eavesdropping on the Cuban Missile Crisis. This is ABC News Nightline. Substituting for Ted Koppel and reporting from Washington, Cokie Roberts. Today we've gained a fascinating insight into a tense time in U.S. history. The John F. Kennedy Library released tape recordings of meetings on October 22, 1962, the day President Kennedy addressed the nation about what came to be called the Cuban Missile Crisis. This government, as promised, has maintained the closest surveillance of the Soviet military buildup on the island of Cuba. Within the past week, unmistakable evidence has established the fact that a series of offensive missile sites is now in preparation on that imprisoned island. The purpose of these bases can be none other than to provide a nuclear strike capability against the Western Hemisphere. Tonight we're going to show you what happened earlier in the day of that speech, let you hear the debate among the president's advisors after they had seen the latest surveillance photos of Soviet missiles 90 miles off the U.S. coast. First, President Kennedy met with his National Security Council, where he explained why he had decided against an airstrike. The idea of a quick strike was very tempting, and I really didn't give up on that until yesterday morning. It looked like we would have all the difficulties of Pearl Harbor and not have finished the job. And so President Kennedy had decided on a blockade of Cuba, what he called a quarantine. One of the men who was in the Security Council meeting is with us tonight. Robert McNamara was the Secretary of Defense. He joins us now from his home near Aspen, Colorado. Secretary McNamara, it was quite a day that day when the president went to the country at night. Can you give us some quickly a sense of what that day was like? It was one of the most dramatic in my life for one reason. as your transcript just indicated. The president said he hadn't decided uh, between a quarantine and an air attack which would lead to an invasion until the morning of the previous day. And that is absolutely correct. And one of the reasons he hadn't decided was that his advisors were deeply split, some supporting the quarantine, others supporting the air attack and invasion. And as a matter of fact, in the morning of the previous day when they met in the second oval uh, second floor oval room in the white house in the family quarters the majority of the advisors favored uh, the air attack and the invasion and yet the president was absolutely obsessed with achieving two objectives one avoiding war and the other removing the missiles many considered those contradictory and and you were the one quickly who who was for the quarantine well at that meeting on sunday morning that he referred to he asked me to present the case for the quarantine and as I recall, he asked General Taylor, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs, to present the case for the air attack and the invasion. As you say, I was for the quarantine. Well, we'll hear more about that when we talk to you later in the broadcast. But first, we'll listen in on the contentious meeting between President Kennedy and the congressional leadership when we come back. This is ABC News Nightline. Brought to you by the all-new Ford Windstar. When is a minivan not a minivan? When you turn old thinking upside down and make it longer and wider for a smoother, secure ride. Next is safety with a capital S. Making it the only minivan that combines standard dual airbags, 5 mile an hour bumpers and anti-lock brakes. Which should suit you to a T erase any idea that the new Ford Windstar is just another minivan. The future belongs to Windstar. If you can
can use a mouse, then you can get out on the internet. With OS2 Warp, we've got a graphical internet. It's pretty killer. The color's nice. The internet has gobs of information. I can send mail back and forth. You can get in a discussion group. We can send audio, pictures. You can talk to people all over the world. I can do this for my house. We're surfing the net there. Great, I like that. This is really, really cool. OS2 Warp, available at your software dealer. Thursday. Ever wanted to get a second chance at life? Meet three people who did. People who turned tragedy and adversity into renewal and rebirth. Their unforgettable and inspiring stories. Primetime, Thursday. We're just looking the world's largest athletic shoe store. Just in time for the holidays, 50% off warm-ups. Famous brands like Adidas, Reebok, Wimbledon, Wilson, 50% off. Wilson and Reebok warm-ups as low as $49.99. Some as low as $39.99. $120 warm-ups now just $59.99. College and pro hooded jackets, half price. Plus, all shoes are on sale. 50% off warm-ups this week. A great holiday gift idea from Just for Pink Weird. 13th Fair is free. In testing, the Lexus GS cornered better than the BMW 540i. You may say that it's only a matter of inches, and you'd be right. But there will be instances on the road where an inch is as good as a mile. And the GS is thousands less than the 540i at Lexus of Nashville. Two hours before President Kennedy went on the air to the nation, he met with the congressional leadership, telling senior members of Congress for the first time about the missiles he had known about for six days. He found members anything but pleased by his handling of the situation. Keep in mind the setting and the cast of characters. The Soviet Union determined to test the young president. His former Senate colleagues not at all certain Kennedy was up to the test. Richard Russell of Georgia, chairman of the House Armed Services Committee and one of the great barons of Congress, was particularly skeptical. Kennedy had no reputation for seriousness in the Senate. But what we hear in these tapes could be called lessons in leadership. A president set on a course he believed was right and insisting on the opportunity to try it. The first voice we'll hear is that of then Secretary of State Dean Rusk, who died just last night. I don't see 
see how we're going to get any stronger or get in any better position to meet this threat. See, we at this crossroads, we either push that power or we're not. Uh, you, have, you have warned these people time and again uh, in uh, the most eloquent speeches I've read to Woodrow Wilson. And uh, you have told them not to do this thing. They've done it. And I think that you, we should assemble as people as possible uh, an adequate force and, and, and clean out that situation. Time is too confident, but we don't have to take this gamble. Uh, I don't know whether Cruz Cruz will launch a nuclear war with Cuba or not. I don't believe he will. But I think that the more that we temporize, the more surely he is to convince himself that we are afraid to make any real uh, movement and, 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 and to really fight. Secretary McNamara, what we were hearing there was Senator Richard Russell essentially saying to President Kennedy, you don't have the guts, you don't have the nerve to do what's really right here, which is to invade. You were the person who had to answer him then. What, what were you thinking? It was a very dramatic moment, Koki. You had just exactly what you described. You had this young president confronting uh, the dean of the Senate, at least in terms of power, the dean of the Senate. Uh, and yet the young man understood the Constitution. The president is the commander-in-chief, and he was determined to exercise his responsibilities as the commander-in-chief, and the first responsibility was to keep this nation out of war. Now, at the same time, he was determined to, and he ultimately did, achieve removal of the missiles from Cuba. What Senator Russell was proposing was war. And the words he used, if I recall correctly, from the transcript you just presented were, I don't know whether this will bring on nuclear war. My God, if he didn't know whether it would bring on nuclear war, why was he recommending it? Surely one wouldn't recommend something that had a, a, a likelihood or even a, a relatively small probability of bringing on nuclear war. In any event, the president was determined to avoid that nuclear war. What about you? This is the man who was the chairman of the committee that was in charge of the Pentagon. And you had to sit there in that meeting and say, you're wrong, Senator Russell. <laughs> I testified before Senator Russell for seven years. And that wasn't the only time I said he was wrong. But I had tremendous admiration for a man. He was a great patriot. He was a great statesman. He understood the responsibility of the Congress. It was the responsibility of the Congress to question the plans of the president. But it was the president's responsibility as commander-in-chief, as I suggest, first, to keep this nation out of war, and second, to make the decisions, even though they ran counter to the advice he received from the dean of the Senate. How much of it was that, that the, they didn't trust him after the Bay of Pigs? How much of it was well, that they thought he didn't have a clue how to deal with Cuba? I think there was some of that, but it was, it was deeper than that. There was a strong antagonism toward Castro and the Castro government. And many, and I think Senator Russell fell in that category, believed that this was an opportunity to overthrow Castro, an opportunity which we should seize. And they also believed that uh, the Soviets would not respond militarily. And in that belief, I think they were totally wrong. Fortunately, we didn't have to test it. But I think all of the evidence, the meetings I've had with Gromyko and, and uh, Dobrynin and other senior Soviet officials over the last five years discussing this have shown that there was an almost certain reaction, a military reaction that would have followed by the Soviets, any U.S. attack on Cuba. And in that case, Senator Russell was totally wrong. Well, we will hear the president taking on Senator Russell when we come back in a moment. I like to treat people the way I like to be treated myself. If you don't like waiting for a service advisor to come wait on you, if you don't like waiting on the phone for an answer or a charge on your bill because nobody told you about it, treat the customers like they were you out there standing on the service truck. For quality care standards, make it easier on the customer here by taking care of them and doing it right. Get your car in here and I'll have to show you. Quality care people, quality care standards at your Ford and Lincoln Mercury dealer. Some days I get these really pounding headaches. I used to take Tylenol, but it didn't always get rid of all the pain. So I've been using Advil for a while now. I found that on my tough headaches, two Advil work better than two extra strength Tylenol tablets, better than extra strength Tylenol caplets, better than Tylenol gel caps. And you know, nothing's been proven to last longer than Advil. For my tough headaches, 
Advil just works better. Advil, advanced medicine for pain. Next time, where to put your investment dollars in 95. Plus actress Connie Selica, director Roman Polanski, and humorist Dave Barry. Good Morning America, here on ABC. Fragrance by Ralph Lauren. Now your gift with any thirty-nine fifty purchase of Safari for men or women at Kastner Knot. Crazy for you. It's the new Gershwin musical comedy with the Tony Award for the best dancing on Broadway and the Tony Award for best musical of the year. Just give us a call for tickets. Our operators are standing by. Ask them for the best musical from Broadway. Crazy for you. The new Gershwin musical comedy. At TPAC January 3rd through 8th. Tickets on sale now at all Ticketmaster outlets or charged by phone. It's now an hour before the president is planning to address the nation, but he's still far from convincing the congressional leaders that his plan for blockade is best. Led by Senator Russell, they start arguing for an invasion, but Kennedy holds firm. The Secretary of Defense, however, does assure Russell that the military is preparing for all contingencies. Here's Robert McNamara 32 years ago. We have been asked by the president to be prepared for any eventuality, and for that purpose, we are moving troops and aircraft to positions uh, from which uh, further deployments can be made uh, in the future. Uh, but I don't want to make a difference to myself, but I, I do would like to complete my statement. I, my, my position is these people have been warned. They've had all the warnings they could expect uh, near here. When you impose this blockade, Khrushchev's ever said up to now that he would fight over Cuba. He's going to start rattling this missile and make it firmer and firmer and firmer statements about what he's going to do about Cuba. And and you will only make it sure that when the, that day comes, when if they do, with will use these makes to attack our shipping or drop a few bombs around Miami or some other place. And we do go in that, that we'll lose a great many more men uh, than we would right now. But Senator, we can't invade Cuba versus uh, it takes us to some while to assemble our force to invade Cuba. That's one of the uh, problems we've got. We haven't wanted to service the movement of troops beyond what has been serviced in the last 48 hours. But we have to bring some troops from the West Coast and to assemble the force, which would give us the 90,000 odd men who might participate in invasion, it would take some day. We are now assembling that force, but we, uh, it is not in a position to invade Cuba in the next uh, 24, 48 hours. Now, I, I think it may very well come to that before the end of the week, but we are moving all the forces that we have that would be necessary for an invasion to the area around Cuba as quickly as we possibly can. We have a much better, much, much nearer escape, uh, an all-out war with, with, with Russia. But we don't have the forces to seize Cuba. Well, we can assemble. Well, so that's what we're doing now. How long? I'm okay. Russia will be making incendiary statements. Exactly. You'll get worse every way it goes, and it makes it more and more sure that when we are forced to uh, take action in Cuba, that we will still have to further divide uh, our forces and, and be weaker at, at every point around the, the, the whole periphery of, of, of the free, free world. I just want to reminisce just a little bit. We were here today. We were told by somebody in the, the Pentagon said, "Not right over there, take us three months to take you to carry uh, out an invasion against a substantial buildup that said twice the Cuba would require uh, use of about 250,000 U.S. military personnel. I like to remember air, sea, and ground personnel. We can't be prepared within seven days to start an invasion. 
2,000 bombings, sorties must take place prior to the invasion. I'd like to ask you, you see from your position in the Pentagon where we are getting better prepared uh, military with these of these the Soviet forces by delaying and waiting for this thing off till next year? We we must have the seven day period of preparation uh, for our invasion. Secretary McNamara, that was you that we were hearing there at the end saying a seven day period of preparation. Was was the president amazed at this kind of response? What, what was he thinking through all of this? Well, I think what he was thinking was that on one point, at least, Senator Russell was absolutely correct. And it was a fundamental point that dictated uh, many of the president's actions. Senator Russell said Khrushchev and the Soviets had been warned over and over again, and he was absolutely correct. The president had said in early September, if the Soviets put missiles in Cuba, we would take action. He didn't specify what action. They had put missiles in Cuba. Clearly, we had to take action. That's why I said earlier, he had two what appeared to be contradictory objectives. Keep the nation out of war, but get the missiles out of Cuba. And Russell emphasized the necessity of the second. What Russell didn't recognize or stress was the magnitude of the invasion. As I suggested, uh, we would uh, have to deploy 250,000 troops. The uh, the air attacks before the invasion would total at least 2,000 sorties. The first day's air attack alone with 1,080 sorties. And this would be a tremendous uh, war, at, which would lead to the death of, we talk later about that if you wish, of thousands of, of Soviets and Cubans. And, and Russell put no emphasis whatsoever on either the losses that we would incur in the invasion itself or the further losses that we'd face if the Soviets, Soviets retaliated as was almost certain to be the case. Did the president think that Russell was just pushing him, pushing on him, no, uh, no, no, trying no. to test him? No, 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 not at all. I don't, I don't think either man looked upon it as a, as a test of the other. But it, it was Russell's approach to, to defense of the nation and the role of the military. And in this particular case, he felt it was essential that we drive those missiles out of Cuba. We had the power to do it. And moreover, as I suggested earlier, there was the secondary objective of ridding uh, the hemisphere of communism. Now, President Kennedy had been in the war as a young man in World War II. Why was he so, so averse to doing something that would involve military well, action? Perhaps because he had been in the war, as had I. And if you've been in a war, and this is one thing that our military understand perhaps more than civilians do, one must avoid war if one possibly can, while at the same time achieving a nation's objectives. In this particular case, we all know the end. We did avoid a war, and we did force the missiles out. In that sense, I think Kennedy proved right in that exchange. Now, now that day of the meeting, you already had known about the missiles for close to a week. That's did, correct. Did you feel that there was a, a time frame there that ended the president, that you only had a few days to make some decision one way or the other? Uh, there was a time pressure. We had to, had to do something. If we were to invade, and the president didn't rule out an invasion. As, as you heard, he instructed me to uh, prepare for an invasion force. And, and was that real? That, it, oh, absolutely. We had, we had uh, ships moving from both coasts to the southeastern coast of the U.S., we had troops moving from all over the country to southeastern U.S. We had Marines moving from Camp Pendleton in California. We had aircraft mobilizing from all over the country. We were prepared for an invasion. Well, I want to Neither hear more. Neither President Kennedy nor I wanted to initiate. To do it. All right, we'll hear more about that when we come back. But first, we'll hear the president blindsided by Senator William Fulbright. What they do is simple. So simple it would be easy to miss it altogether. But they're making a difference. You see, drunk driving fatalities are down 32% in the last 10 years. And fatalities from teen drunk driving are down 60%. So to everyone who checks an ID, offers to call a cab, or helps a customer know when to say when, we extend our thanks. By doing what's right, you are making things better. A message from Budweiser.
The clean machine from Coleman PowerMate does such a great job cleaning cars and decks and grills, you may find yourself testing its power on all sorts of things. Ooh. The clean machine. Surprise someone. From Coleman PowerMate. I will build a motor car for the great multitude, constructed of the best materials by the best men and women to be hired. Any person making a good salary will be able to own one and enjoy with his family the blessings of hours of pleasure in God's great open spaces. Run San Francisco for a year on 5 billion kilowatt hours of electricity. But could you generate it with less risk of acid rain or global warming? We can, using a fuel we'll never run out of. In fact, we may have picked up some from you today. The fuel that fires our trash to energy plants, otherwise known as garbage. What business do we have saying we help the environment? That is our business. They're still around, and these diseases could be life-threatening if you don't protect your baby from them. Full protection takes around five visits for shots, starting by two months and ending by age two. Ask if your baby is up to date on every visit to your doctor. Or if you don't have a doctor, call 1-800-232-2522 to find out where to get your baby shots. When it comes to immunization, your baby's counting on you. Wherever you live, wherever you go, same kinds of problems. Same way to get some real help. The Boys Town National Hotline. Someone who cares and knows what to do. Call anytime, toll free. The Boys Town National Hotline. 1-800-448-3000. There's help at the end of the line. It's now about 45 minutes before President Kennedy's speech, but congressional opposition to his plan is not diminishing, it's growing, and it's coming from an unexpected quarter. Arkansas's William Fulbright, chairman of the Foreign Relations Committee. The president had reason to expect Fulbright to side with him, but he was in for a disappointment, as we now hear from Senator Fulbright.
Russian sites and the Russian ship, the Russian ship. I mean, you can take it safe. 